Well, I'm going to I'm going to sit down for this section, but my name is Scott Ogden, I focus here at CSIS on global trends analysis, uh, and I work with some of their groups here in, in the audience. Um, so urbanization is one of these things that I've been thinking about for a long time, and um, you could actually take a much longer view of it. I mean, if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, we only had 10% of the planet living in cities. Uh, in 2007, 2008, we finally hit 50% living in cities. And that's going to probably get somewhere in the 60s, uh, maybe 62, 66, between now and uh, the middle of the century. So we're looking at some major change still in terms of how much we're urbanizing. Um, some things that are important to think about there um, is a lot of economic action happens in the cities. It's 75 percent of global GDP is stuff that's coming from cities. Um, so if you're looking at these longer term trends, one of the things you'll see right away is that cities are obviously a focus area in terms of uh, long term economic policies. Uh, mega cities. How many of you are familiar with mega cities? Big cities on the planet, right? There's a few of them uh, today. Uh, we have 28 of them on the planet today. Uh, the UN has it at about 43 by 2030. I have it at 56 in 2035. Um, so you're going to see a lot of these big cities. These are cities that have 10 million or more people living in them uh, at that period of time. And so we might get to the point where we need to redefine what a mega city is again, uh, because maybe 10 million is too low, and there's so many cities on that list to pay attention to. Uh, there's a lot of cities you could pull out that are really, I think, worth looking at. The ones the military, I think, obviously are interested in, a lot of development experts are interested in, Dhaka, uh, Lagos, uh, another one we might want to add is uh, Kinshasa. All three of those cities have increased 40 times in size since 1950. Rapid, rapid urbanization. Uh, and what's really important to see there is it actually triggers a lot of some of the challenges you see when you get down to uh, violence, crime, et cetera, because uh, rapid urbanization actually leads to quite a few of those factors. It creates slums. So if you look across the planet, these you see a lot of these spaces where uh, the infrastructure is not so great. Uh, maybe the government's not as, uh, as connected to the society as it should be in some of those spaces. Um, and they can be really small like little fishing villages in uh, Lagos that uh, the police decide that they don't want to go into. Uh, they could be in Mumbai, Cairo, Karachi, Nairobi, Mexico City. All of them have slums of over a million people. In fact, you can look at some areas in India where if you combine elements inside of the states of India, you can actually find 60% of a particular state uh, that's basically slums. So one thing that's really important in this conversation is as you look at urbanization rates, we're going to urbanize quickly. And we have actually urbanized quite a bit over the 20th century already. But it's really trying to figure out what do you do with these new spaces, how do you develop them in slightly different ways. So something that Bob would be very proud of me for saying is that governance matters. Something he's been harping on for a long time here at CSIS is as you look at the approaches that we do for development policy and a few other areas, is a lot of times we have formal and informal in our minds. And we look at the informal or things that we think are informal structures, and we try to formalize them. It doesn't always work, um, because one of the things you find out quickly is if you look at these more informal structures, is they end up providing a lot of the services in that area. And that's where you start seeing a lot of the uh, illegal activity also taking place, or what we define as sometimes illegal activity taking place, to sort of fill in the gap in governance. Um, so sort of a formal, informal, maybe a hybrid structure, trying to think through what the government's models are. How do you decentralize in ways in which you can provide services in those regions? Um, lots of trends we could pull out that are worth looking at. Uh, Long-term implications of climate change, food and water insecurity. If you're interested in water, by the way, USAID just came out with a new toolkit on water that's worth looking at. Uh, I just looked at it this morning. Uh, you can maybe throw in migration issues, and that's actually kind of an area where we need to improve some analysis because we have sort of squishy numbers in terms of how people are migrating across the planet. We don't really have a really good uh, approach, I think, or a really good methodology in terms of looking at the longer-range trends in terms of how people are migrating across the planet. Um, gender, uh, lots of things you could say about gender. I'll just pick on the guys because I'm a guy. Uh, men, 20 to 29 tend to take um, to work in these areas, and I think it's really important to think about the impact of youth. If you have a question about youth, make sure to ask Nicole Golden in the back because I know she does a lot of work on youth. Um, but there's a lot of really interesting things we should be thinking about. Obviously, if you don't provide jobs in these areas, it's going to lead to some more free time and the ability to go out and do some of the activities that we should be talking about today. And then the last thing that's worth really talking about here in the space is who takes charge in this environment. One of the things that I've been frustrated on and looking at this longer term trends, same thing you see in human uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, who takes charge in the US government on some of these issues? Who's the sort of main point person looking at the problems of urbanization? I think there's a lot of groups that need to be involved because 
the first thing that you sort of describe in this space is it's very complicated. It's not just looking at some specific economic policies that fix the environment. It's maybe even bringing architects who are thinking about designing some of these spaces. So it's a really complicated area to get into. Who takes over in that role uh, in the US government? Uh, but that's sort of the big drivers that I see, and there's all sorts of other things we could get into, what are the push and pull uh, factors that we see going forward, uh, but those are the big drivers that I see sort of shaping our planet over the next 20 or 30 years in terms of urbanization um, and some of the violence that it might bring. Okay, thanks, Good morning, everybody. Um, nice to see some friendly faces. You're all friendly faces. Um, I just want to start with a caveat that I am absolutely not an expert in urban violence and I would also like to add I don't think there's really anybody who should honestly say they're experts in urban violence because I think this is something we're all beginning to struggle with. But I'd like to, the second point is why do we care about urban violence in places like Lagos or Karachi or Tegucigalpa <laughs> where I live? Why does that matter? Um, creating spaces of lawlessness, we're all interconnected. I think about that CNN lady, what happens over here, impacts over here, that really is true, and that was hit home Saturday, reading the Washington Post, and 13 members of MS-13, a Latin American gang, indicted in Northern Virginia. Now, this is uh, one of the two main gangs in Honduras, in El Salvador, and in Guatemala. So what happens in Karachi really has, in urban violence, as an effect on all of us. I just wanna make two points today really two points. One is you need to be very clear as to the problem you're trying to solve. This sounds really logical, but it's astounding how often we chase after symptoms instead of the problem. Um, and also, uh, we need to be able to learn. This is a, a field we don't know much about, it's, and as soon as we learn about it, it's already changed. So we need to have ways to get in, do <coughs> carry out some experiments, to analyze those experiments, learn, document, share that information, and then shake and repeat, and over and over and over. This is something that we, as institutions, as government, we need to be able to have this ability. Really quick, what does urban violence in Honduras look like? It's primarily in three cities. They're not mega cities. They're tiny little cities of about a million people. Um, homicide is the homicide rate in Honduras is the highest in the world. Um, it primarily takes place in low-income slums, but low-income, unplanned, chaotic places that are have very, very poor services and very little uh, presence of the government, especially the security forces. In Honduras, 70 to 80 percent of this astoundingly high uh, homicide rate are caused by gangs, primarily the two gangs, MS-13 and uh, 18th Street. Young men are the primary perpetrators and victims. Um, almost 80% are gun related. Here's a really terrible statistic if you're living in one of these low income areas. 98% of the murders in Honduras, or any crime in general, but specifically murders, are go unpunished. So there's 98% impunity rate. People don't trust the police who are sworn to bring law and order, and even if they did, the gangs are in a much better position to impose their will than the police. They have more guns, they got better communication equipment, they have better transport, they have better everything. So it's a pretty grim scenario. So that's Honduras. And I think you could probably, uh, uh, Karachi, we had somebody from Pakistan recently with us. It is so much more complicated in Karachi. It is so much more complicated. So learn, learn, learn. So getting clarity as to the, as to the problem. I often think about this as I show up at the doctor, I have a really bad cough, he gives me cough syrup. The problem I have is tuberculosis. He didn't touch that. He went after the symptom. And so often we do that. I learned this in Colombia, where the Colombians spent uh, four decades chasing after the, the FARC guerrillas and chasing after coca as the two main problems. Turns out they were not the problems, they were the symptoms of the problem. The problem was, and they learned this after a year of analysis, was that there were vast parts of the country that were ungoverned, and that permitted the FARC and the coca to, to be present. So once they figured that out, reshaped the, the problem, which was uh, lack of state presence, then they could come with the solution, which was state presence. So getting to Honduras, we were very clear. We need to be clear as to what the problem is. So we quickly pulled together two focus groups, one of civil society, one of international community. Tell us what, the, what is causing the violence. We heard a whole bunch of stuff. It was education, it's poverty, it's high unemployment, it's family violence, it's high levels of inequality, it's weak institutionality. I'm thinking, can't be all those, but most of those have gotta be symptoms. Let's just take a simple one, a very logical one, which you re made reference to. I'm a young man, I can't get a job, uh, and I live in an area that's flooded with guns and drugs, and I'm extorting, people are extorting, 
of course, my logical solution is going to be to turn to that, except next door Nicaragua is even poorer than Honduras, has a just as high an unemployment rate, and they have a, a, a homicide rate that's only slightly above the United States. So it's not a direct cause and effect. Unemployment and uh, poverty do not lead inexorably to, to violence. So what is it? We ended up settling on institutionality, coming back to the 98% impunity rate. The police can't do their job, but they have to do their job. So we, we decided that for us, it's going to be uh, bringing, helping bring to a very local level the state institutions, specifically looking at the police and the, the justice sector. Um, what are the challenges that we face and that I think we as development practitioners dealing in urban violence face? Um, one is, a big one, is well-financed criminals are always going to be two, five, eight steps ahead of us. They're learning faster. Their, their business models are much more efficient. So we're always behind. Um, the security and justice sectors are constrained by rule of law. If you're a bad guy and I don't like your look because you're my problem, <laughs> we can't do that as development workers. So that puts us another step behind the criminals. Um, we tend to think linear. As human beings, we think in cause and effect. And that is a really good thing if you're looking at measles or food security or getting girls into school. If we put in some technical assistance and some inputs, this will inexorably lead to that. But unfortunately, the systems we're dealing with are complex. And what happens over here certainly will have an impact over there, but it's going to go through a series of gears and shifts and clouds to get over there. It's very complex. We think as human beings in cause and effect. We as institutions think in cause and effect. That's a, a big challenge to us. Another big challenge is related to cause and effect is if the problem is 98% imp impunity, why don't we make them more like us? And how do we do that? We give them computers and cars and training and we get new laws and they'll become more like us. The Woodrow Wilson Center recently did a study, $2 billion over 20 years in Latin America of uh, rule of law assessment rule of law assistance and reform, almost nothing to show for it because the problem is not, uh, it's not technical, it's a political problem. We as institutions have a hard time dealing with politics. It's so much better dealing with technical stuff. So that's a big challenge we have. And the last one I want to mention as a challenge is that once we come up with a solution in Honduras, it's not going to be that useful anywhere else because it's very different. Karachi is very different than Tegucigalpa. But there is hope. And really quickly, what I want to do is get start with a quote as I wrap up here. Cultural quit critic Wendell Berry. The problem is that we are terrifyingly ignorant. The most learned of us is ignorant. The acquisition of knowledge always involves the revelation of more ignorance. So ignorance. OK, we, I think we all agree with that. So we need to learn. And we need to keep learning. And we need to systematize. We need to institutionalize. And we have to learn in real time. We as government institutions have a very hard time learning in real time. We're always learning about stuff that happened two years ago. Uh, analysis. Part of learning is analyzing. We are really good at analyzing cause and effect. We are terrible at analyzing complex systems. We are <laughs> terrible. How do we become better at that? We need to become better at that. Uh, we need to challenge conventional wisdom. Um, sounds pretty obvious, but when we got to Honduras, we were told communities and police are never going to work with, uh, with each other. They never will. Don't even think about it. We challenged that. It turned out to be absolutely wrong. Who knows how many other <laughs> conventional, much other conventional wisdom out there is constraining what we do. OK, this is a really simple one. Learn from the past instead of implementing the same inconsequential and wasteful programs. We heard that today. I was at a presentation two weeks ago with a European country I will not name that was talking about what they're going to do with the Attorney General's office. They're going to give them computers and cars and training and make new laws. And I felt sorry for them because they were young. I said, how is that different from what AID just stopped doing because it wasn't working? And how is that different from what everybody else is trying to do? How is that different? Why do you think it's going to be different? Of course, they, I created enemies, but I thought, this is a really serious question. We cannot keep doing the same thing and expect to have a different outcome. Political leadership was mentioned. We need to find those people with political will at the top level, at the PTA level. Find those people. Find those people that are having success in the same exact situation as everybody else, same level of resources they're having success. Find those and support them. Um, inside and outside experts. I'm almost done, I promise. Inside and outside experts. We have the experts, we, the outsiders, we don't have all the answers by any means. And then you, perhaps in some, in some community, 
you don't have anything more than what you have. We need to combine force on that. Sounds obvious, but it's astounding how often it doesn't happen. And just to paraphrase Steve Jobs, who it turns out I just learned recently was paraphrasing a complex systems principle, is that nothing, it doesn't make sense looking forward. It only makes sense looking backwards. And that comes back to the learning, the assessing, and the analyzing. So let me just wrap up real quick with be clear as to what your problem is. If you're not clear what your problem is, you're going to be chasing your symptoms and you're not going to get anywhere. Experiment and learn and analyze and document. Experiment, learn, analyze and document. And we can't ever stop because this problem is just going to get bigger and bigger and worse and worse and keep having an impact on us and we can't lose heart. That's it. Wow, that was perfect. Wow. <laughs> Well played, sir. Thanks, Miguel. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I guess what I want to do is start off with uh, this picture of this uh, mosquito that uh, is carrying the malaria virus. Um, and so, you know, there's been a lot of conversations lately, obviously, about infectious diseases. So I figured this would be a good way to start this presentation. And so you're asking, why am I showing this to you? Um, Basically because we have a lot to learn from the, the public health community in terms of how they go about developing comprehensive plans to uh, prevent infectious diseases and also treat those who are already infected. Um, there's a lot that we can learn um, from the, the public health community that can be applied to the violence prevention work that we're doing in many of these communities in Central America where we see uh, gang violence that's uh, out of control. And so what does a comprehensive plan look like on the ground? Um, and so before I get to answering or trying to answer that question, I want to start off with a story um, to hopefully convey this point to you about a 10-year-old boy named Jose who lives in a neighborhood in Chamelecon, Honduras. Jose in his 10 years has already been exposed to a series of risk factors that make him a candidate for gang recruitment. The first risk factor is a critical life event that's happened to him. His mother died because of gang violence. She was sh caught in the crossfire of two gangs shooting it out. His father then decided to migrate to the US with his younger sister. And so now Jose is living with his grandmother, who's in her late 60s. The second risk factor, um, obviously, then is lack of parental supervision. So Jose is now living with a grandmother who is working all day to make a living and pay the extortion tax. And then the third risk factor is negative peer influence. So Jose has friends in the gang. His own brother is an active gang member. And so most of the people that he's hanging out with at all hours of the day are already active and trying to recruit him. So then what, is his, what does Jose's life look like then on a daily basis? Well, Jose gets up early in the morning to go to school. His grandmother's already left work to go sell tortillas. He walks about a mile to school through unpaved streets and walls covered in graffiti. He gets to a school that's falling apart and dilapidated. Some of the teachers are there, some show up, some don't because they're concerned about gang violence. Others are on strike. So after spending a day in an environment that is probably not the most conducive to learning, he goes home in the afternoon to an empty home. And then his friend Ricardo, who just joined a gang at the age of 10, comes looking for Jose and describes to him this wonderful world of camaraderie that he can be a part of if he decides to join MS. And so this picture that I've depicted for you is obviously pretty grim, but even within these realities, there are always solutions that can be found in these communities and people who are working very hard to make some kind of positive influence. So who are those people that touch Jose's life that could actually help reduce some of these risk factors and steer him on a more positive path? Well, the teachers, those family members, again, it doesn't have to be parents, it can be aunt, uncle, grandparents, siblings, um, you know, people who can mentor Jose, coaches of sports teams, church leaders, people that work in a community center, even those positive friends in school who aren't in a gang who can also have a more positive influence on Jose. And so what often happens in these communities is that you have all these potential points of contact, but nobody's coordinating any of the, the efforts that are going on in the community. And so as somebody said, I think it actually was Enrique Bendoncourt at one point, that the opposite of violence is coordination. And I would say that you often see that in these communities that what's happening and what is deterring coming up with a plan to deal with urban gang violence is the fact that people aren't collaborating together and so you have a lot of different programs happening 
but they're not they're dealing oftentimes with symptoms and not again sort of the root causes going back to the point that Miguel made and so what we often see on the ground is that usually a mayor who has a vision or some service provider is able at some point to bring together all these different actors again the teachers the coaches the church leaders the private sector person who owns the store um, and to begin to better analyze what is happening in this community what are the risk factors that our young people are exposed to and making them more susceptible to gang recruitment how do we better collect information and data on crime statistics in this community so that we can better inform our decisions about we need street lighting over here because crimes are happening at 11 p.m. and people are getting mugged after leaving a bar how do we improve this street how do we clean up the graffiti so this place has a feeling of of safety and security what do we do about the local park the local sports complex etc and then what do we do about building trust between the community and the police um, you know there's obviously a major breakdown um, in trust which then leads to a lack of reporting of crimes and impunity and then what do we do to work with uh, to do more about working with youth like Jose so those who are on the cusp of joining um, but haven't yet and then there's those like his brother who have already joined and so what do you do with them how do you help them get out of the gang reinsert themselves back into society programs like tattoo removal psychosocial counseling workforce development etc and so the ability to be able to bring together all these people around a table and design a real comprehensive plan is something that can actually work at the community level and we actually have evidence to prove this we have just concluded a three-year impact evaluation of in four countries in Central America using a randomized control trial and so I'm gonna make a little plug here that on October 30th we'll be launching the findings of that study at the Woodrow Wilson Center so you're all invited um, and we'll be talking about some of the findings from that study and some of the things that we've seen can work on the ground um, and so I think my time is up and I'll end there thank you So I would say in terms of things that aren't working, um, and I think it, this goes to the point that uh, Miguel was making, that we're oftentimes chasing, chasing symptoms, right? We're not actually looking at the root causes, the risk factors for why young males, in particular in Central America, are getting involved in gangs. And so better understanding what those risk factors are is important for us going forward and doing this work. And then going to the point that I was making earlier about the real need to develop comprehensive plans that address the aspect of prevention let's keep these kids out of joining gangs let's focus on those who have already joined and want to leave um, you know those kids who are in the juvenile system for example that once they get out have no option for any kind of uh, service delivery and so it becomes a vicious cycle where they eventually graduate to the adult prison prison system where currently in Central America you have prisons that are running at 300 percent over capacity and so obviously you know that is not working and so again, you know, the idea of coordination really and it's a simple concept, but how do you bring all these people together at the community level who have a vested interest in improving security? You know, again, from the, the police officers to the teachers to the, the store owner um, to the parents, uh, you know, everybody has a vested interest in making this work. And when there is glimmers of hope, it's when these people do come together and actually sit down and analyze what's happening in the community, which then leads to, you know, policy decisions that a mayor can take. So things like establishing a crime observatory so they can have better access to data and information or a comp stat system in a police department that helps them better um, analyze what's happening in terms of uh, crime and, and insecurity and then the you know the issue the, you know the relationship with the police has always been very complicated um, and, and Miguel was talking about this um, as well that you know the the breakdown in trust obviously leads to a lot of issues and a lot of problems and there's but there are efforts underway to try and improve that and we think that community policing is 
is something that um, you know can can have an impact over the long term in, in terms of improving that relationship. But you know, it's not an easy thing. To answer that question, am I on? I'd like to refer you all to a report that came out in 1949 that dealt with the things that we needed to be learning about. I'm being only semi tongue in cheek. I think a lot of the issues we deal with are the same issues we deal with all over the place. Uh, coordination is a major issue everywhere and always will be because we're a bunch of ego driven individuals and institutions and we hate to share information or share credit. So that's a big part of it. Uh, but I think at a more uh, micro level in Honduras and related to urban violence, I think it's the learning piece. Just to, to, to beat that horse a little more is we need to be able to learn. Um, and we need to keep learning. And we're terrible learners. We are terrible. As institutions, we have processes for learning which just don't work very well. Uh, referring back to what, what Enrique was saying, this process of bringing everybody together, you know, the, the, the champions, the positive deviants, bringing all those together, of course, that's how you do it. But we as institutions have really limited time spans and we purchase uh, contract time and indicators and etc. It might take this community one year. It might take these guys three years. We only got 18 months per the contract. And so, I mean, that's, a, that's an issue we have right there. Um, and I think the fact that the nature of what we do is so terra incognita, it's so unstructured what we do, it's really hard for us as institutions to be able to get in there and go do something. Because we just, we, we tie ourselves down by the nature of institutions. Um, everything is the answer. Everything. I, and I think that this gets back to the same, I think, problems that uh, Miguel and uh, Enrique were both talking to, is that these systems are so complex that when you change something over here, it has an impact. And that's why I think it's, um, if you're looking at what are the, the root causes of poverty in the certain regions, again, it's, it's specific to the state that you're looking at in terms of what types of things you might be able to do, that one solution in Honduras that sort of resonates doesn't necessarily translate exactly to Nicaragua uh, or another city or another state uh, that you might be interested in. Um, so as you look at the trends long term, you see a lot of local trends, you see a lot of regional trends, you see sort of the big trends. And again, I, my talk at the beginning was mainly on the bigger trends. So as I look at those bigger trends, uh, a lot of times we look at technology as this really great tool that's going to fix everything. Now it, it it helps in certain ways, right? If you look at uh, Hong Kong, you look at uh, narrow casting. That's where you're taking a technology, broadcasting it to local audience using something like FireChat as a way of improving local conversations. So there are some pieces that you can stick out there for communication tools. Uh, but in terms of the trends that we're seeing, um, I think a lot of them have been going positively. We talk about food has actually been positive in terms of trend for the last 20 years. Water, we have more people today with clean water than we had 20 years ago. Um, but how much longer does that last, I think is the part that most of us have really been focusing on. I don't think it can last much longer. And that moment in time is going to hit soon. And on top of all of this is climate change and the fact that most of these people live really close to the coastline. Uh, and you get to the point where maybe all of Bangladesh or at least a whole a large portion of Bangladesh is underwater. So there's huge areas across the planet where, as you bring in other factors, I think um, uh, they'll experiencing a lot of different things over the next 20 years. So I think there's a lot of things here, but uh, mainly I think it's resource factors in terms of how they'll play out over the next 20 or 30 years. Mm. Thanks, John. Okay, so we'll open it up to uh, questions for anybody who uh, would like to ask a question in the panel. Yes, ma'am. Is this working? Yeah. Um, I'm doing a lot of research on state fragility and resilience. And one of the things that pops up is the importance of political legitimacy. And all of you have stressed the importance of interventions at the local level. But if you do that and strengthen the police presence, that is an extension of the state, which lacks legitimacy. Can you focus on the local area without also focusing on the central government and building that political legitimacy so you pierce that distrust that you all talked about. Just pushing the police into the urban areas, as we see even in this country in Ferguson and other areas, isn't a solution if the community does not trust the police. So 
How do you bridge that gap between political legitimacy and local capacity? I want to take a crack at that. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, one of the major problems that we faced when we started the Village Stability Operations Program in Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, was that we had been on the outside looking in for a decade. We were, we were literally trying to put scalps on the barn, uh, a trip to Taliban and win the war that way. And, and in 2009, 2010, we made the decision to literally move into these communities and live there, uh, to embed ourselves in those communities, sometimes with Afghan Special Forces, sometimes by ourselves. But at a minimum, our guys lived in these villages, these rural villages in Afghan compounds for a year. Uh, and, and when we quit driving to work and we actually started living there for long periods of time, now granted we were not part of civil society there, we started to see things that, that we were not seeing before. And you really alluded to it. One is this trust deficit. The reality is whether it's a, a major urban area in Honduras or whether it's a rural farming village in Afghanistan, the reach of the state today is extremely limited in a lot of these places. And in these undergoverned areas, what you find are clan societies based on honor, and revenge and hospitality and feud and traditional systems that have handled their own affairs for a very long period of time. And, and, and certainly what we've seen through the Stability Institute talking to other folks that are working programs like this bottom up is that those systems are just as degraded. The clan based systems of honor and, and, and dispute resolution are extremely damaged. And those many times are the threads that are being pulled either by violent extremists, insurgents or gangs is that the, the resilience of, of informal civil society, the honor-based systems are, real, are beaten up really bad. And, and one of the things that I've noticed to Miguel's comments about us as a society, for a range of reasons, we tend to project that Western lens whenever we go into a place and even understanding clan society, understanding the, the, the rule of the clan, as Mark Weiner calls it in his book, and how bottom-up actually works along lines of honor and revenge and hospitality is often radically different than things we understand in our society of contract. Sorry, I have to interrupt you. This number is like 93 on the second floor. Awesome. So We're leaving. Like, <laughs> I'm really annoyed. Um, so we have to ask you to use the, one of the sitting down microphones. Yeah, sure. So very about that. Sorry, we'll <laughs> Beautiful. I told you it would be unconventional, did I not? <laughs> All right. We'll see how that one plays out. But, but at the end of the day, to, to, to get to your point, I think that as a, as a community, we've got to do a better job of understanding and valuing clan society. And whether that's gangs, whether that's tribes, whether that's ethnic groups, uh, beyond the reach of the state, clans function in a certain way traditionally, and they're broken. And if we don't get in there and understand that, that trust deficit is going to be very difficult to close. But we have seen uh, uh, embedded policemen in Salinas, California, in the New England states that are actually living and working in these communities that seem to be having more of an impact. But my, my question went to the central government. I agree with you on what you say in terms of effectiveness and operationally. But my, my question goes, especially in the Honduras situation, I don't know about the other countries, doesn't, doesn't the lack of trust in the central government present an obstacle to getting that kind of local efficacy that you are advocating. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so. But I think it's not an either-or question. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's something we've talked about a lot in within the USAID mission preparation for our new strategy is where do we focus? And it's, not, it's neither that nor that. It's both and it's the range yep. in between. And it comes back to the point I, I made very quickly is find those leaders. I mean, the president of Honduras right now, I don't want to get too much in Honduras, he's got a lot of political will. He's shown a lot of political will. And there's political will all over the place. You just need to find those lights of political will and then somehow reinforce those and try to connect them. Um, yeah, because legitimacy is key to everything. And just to add to that, I mean, oftentimes we're waiting for the, you know, the right political reform to happen at the national level to move forward with anything. And I think, uh, you know, Miguel's point is you can find the champions at the local level. You can find the police officer in the community who can be a champion for building trust and, and a better relationship with, uh, with that community. You don't have to wait for something to happen at the national level. Ideally, that's also happening at the same time and that, that legitimacy is being built there. But uh, at, at the same time, that shouldn't deter us from trying to move forward with working with uh, these communities as we wait for the national level governments to catch up in terms of some of the policies that they need to put into place. Okay, next question. Back there. <coughs> Not a question, a comment. Um, I think one of the things you also have to do is look at, Miguel was talking earlier about the institutionality present. In the case of 
of Columbia, there's lots of laws on the books that tell you how the police can work with a community. And again, the main problem is to get them to actually do what the law says. Um, I mean, and we work, um, and I think the OTI program in, in, in Columbia as well, in effect, getting the communities to be able to take control of the police in their communities, to get the mayor to actually have some authority, to get the security committees which exist by law but don't operate to function. So you're talking about building institutionality at the local level that then becomes part of the sense of community, the sense of Let's just like to make one comment. We spent a long time within our program in Honduras trying to figure out political will. We were, we're all really smart. We came down to political will. Yay, we got to figure it out. What the heck is political will? What is it? Um, and so we spent a long time wrestling with that. Every week we would spend some time on it. And really what it comes down to is accountability. So it's related to what you're saying, Joel. I mean, the very, very, very simple definition for me at the, at, the, at, the, at the local level is accountability. Holding, there's a mechanism for holding leadership, holding authority, and vice versa, holding community accountable. So it's, it's accountability. And that's, but how you do that, we're still not there yet. Not an answer, but uh, I, I would like to share because I, um, I think many of the things that have been said by the three of you really resonates with, with my experience working for the national government of Mexico and dealing particularly with Ciudad Juarez. Um, and, and the lessons learned are exactly on the, on, on the same track you, you were mentioning. I just want to, to, to bring that example and give some, some uh, very quick uh, um, like highlights on, on that particular experience. The first one is that we were in Mexico addressing a problem of 17 homicides per 100,000 nationwide, right? We were between 17 to 20 in 2010. Uh, when we started looking at the problem, uh, and we noticed that obviously the problem was mo mostly focused on youth, on male and youth. Uh, and when we, when we started looking at the rate for that particular population, we understood that the rate in Mexico was not 20, but was 46 for that particular group. That's more or less the same rate, for example, for uh, Belize. Then we said, okay, it's not, we know that the problem is not only male who are young in this country, but the ones who are also living in certain places. So when we looked at that particular rate in the state of Chihuahua in 2010, we realized that the, the, mur the, the murder rate for young men in the state of Chihuahua, just young men, no, I'm not saying gang members or anything like that, it was, it was close to 300 homicides per 100,000. That's worse than San Pedro Sula today. Just, right? just for perspective, the US, it's, a, it's just under six per 100,000. Yes, the world average is seven. Uh, then we looked at Ciudad Juarez. So young men living in Ciudad Juarez in 2010 were living under a murder rate of high 500 homicides per 100,000. The ones living in the worst places in Ciudad Juarez were like above 3,000 homicides per 100,000. So the question, because it, it's related to, to the question of data, how do, you, how do you incorporate data? And just let's imagine, because this, imagine a, a conference with the president addressing a problem, a national problem of 20 homicides per 100,000. When the discussion about 20 homicides per 100,000 was happening at the presidential office, it was the wrong kind of question. We were facing a problem of 3,000 homicides per 100,000 rate for a certain population in certain places. And the way we wanted to address it was like through, obviously we, we, we knew that we had to reform police, judicial system, and, and all these things. But today, right now with that rate, how do we uh, address that problem? How do we go to these places, very tiny places in Ciudad Juarez? You could, there are 1.3 million inhabitants in Ciudad Juarez every day going to work, going to schools, shopping, crossing the border, back and forth businesses like thriving and everything at the same time. So the, the importance of understanding urban dynamics, how small places really play a, a role, how do you really incorporate social prevention schemes, but do you, at the same time you need to address law enforcement in a much smarter way. One thing that we learned is that prevention is not retroactive. You cannot bring the services today to a population that never received it when they need it and expect for, for those things to really reduce 
murder rates or criminal uh, activity in that, those places because you just came with a new park and great schools or improved whatever. So you really have to address Jose, you really have to address Ricardo, his, his brother, you really have to address the ones who, are don't, who don't want to belong to the gang anymore, but you also have to address the ones who don't want to leave the gang. Those who are already involved in that particular uh, activities, uh, just you know, perpetrating uh, uh, violence all over the place. So I think um, just with that example, I would love to, to, to close down and, and see your reactions to that. Because I, I think I, you're, you're dealing exactly with the same problem, in, at least in San Pedro, in, in Tegucigalpa. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're obviously preaching to the choir with us up here. I mean, in the, you know, we constantly talk about that there has to be a much more integrated approach between what we do on the social prevention side with what we do on the law enforcement side. And so oftentimes it's become a discussion of either or, and that's not the right approach. And so what we're trying to do with, you know, conversations with host governments and, and others, you know, is to part of this learning agenda is to show where this has actually worked, where this combination of these two approaches can have that desired impact where you're treating somebody like Jose, who's more of a, would fit more of a prevention profile, and his brother, Ricardo, who's, you know, in the gang and maybe wants to leave, and what do you do about that profile of individual um, who's out perpetrating crimes? Um, you know, what do you do about better data collection so that the local mayor knows where to invest his resources or where to deploy the police? Um, you know, these are all things that, that sound basic, but they're, they're very hard to do at the local level, and so, we talk about coordination as if it's an easy thing, and I, you know, I brought that up in my, my opening piece as part of a comprehensive plan, but where it does, where you do see it work and where it's effective, it's because all those pieces have come together to some degree, and so um, you know, I think that's going forward, thinking about positive solutions, we do need to continue to talk about you know, this idea of mirroring these, these approaches, the public health approach plus the law enforcement. Those of you who don't know me might not believe this, but I'm actually a very optimistic person. Um, but if I just use that as a prelude to throwing out another huge challenge to this whole thing is money, it's resources. Um, as I said in, in my presentation, the Honduran police are out resourced in every single way. There are no services in these communities. So is the question then for we as outsiders, you as a consultant in Ciudad Juarez representing the government, we, whoever we represent, do we go in and do we create little pockets of excellence? Do we throw all our resources at this one community? Do we, I mean, how do we do this? It's, it's a huge triage because we as the international community have the luxury with our nice big fat checks to go in and create <coughs> little pockets of perfection. But I think all of us recognize that's, that's silly. Uh, but then what, how do we, operate in an environment such as Honduras and other countries, the, the government is basically bankrupt. They're bankrupt. And so if we're looking at sustainability, what does that look like in an environment with homicides for 3,000 per 100,000? How does that work? There's a way for it, I'm sure. Please. You started to talk about the um the young men who are already part of gangs, I would think that would be the hardest <coughs> the hardest group to focus on because I imagine there's a lot of danger in trying to get out of the gang, even if there is the will or the desire or the resources once you're out. I mean, how do you address in working with these youth that <coughs> they're sort of safe and exit? Like, what is the exit strategy, I guess, is, is my question. Okay, again, I'm a very positive person, but this is a very grim statistic for Honduras. The only way to get out of a gang is to leave the country, is to join a church, or is to die or go to prison. No, that even going to prison because you're still in the gang. So there's really only those three. There is a, a really nice program in San Pedro Sula, which is the most <coughs> violent city in Honduras. It's, a, it's run by the Catholics to rehabilitate gang members. They have a 50% homicide rate, mortality rate in that group. It is extremely hard in Honduras to get out of a gang. So, I mean, it's just, that's just another factor in this very, very complex system. Just one observation. No, we, we also, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we also need to change the conversation, though, in, in the region about what it means to work with somebody who um, isn't a gang or has left a gang. So this idea of doing gang reinsertion programs has been pretty stigmatized in the region, right? There's this concept of, um, you know, these people are, uh, you know, th there's no real opportunity for any second chances. They're sort of the undesirables, just throw them in jail and we'll solve the problem and it'll go away. And so 
And so it is complicated for somebody to leave, as Miguel has pointed out. Um, but at the same time, there are programs out there that are doing work with uh, former gang members that, you know, I think offer opportunities for some learning and, and potential expansion. Because at the end of the day, these are the people that are committing the crimes in the community, right? So if we're not addressing, you know, uh, that particular population group, um, it's going to be very hard in the long term to sort, you know, solve the problem of crime and violence in many of these communities. We can do a whole lot of work on the prevention side and invest millions of dollars, but if we're not addressing you know what we like to call the hot people in the hot zone those who are really out there committing crimes you know the impact is going to be at the end of the day pretty pretty minimal so yeah just a couple things too that that uh, we've been seeing at the stability institute is and, and i just was up in salinas california uh spending time with chief mcmillan they've got a pretty interesting program going up there uh where they're doing a lot of bottom-up work in the in the village of hebron uh, the murder rate in Salinas is about 150,000, but it's about 20 per year, which is you know pretty darn high for for the U.S. certainly. Uh, and they've had a real problem there, but they they've been employing some bottom up stuff there. But uh, Salinas is right at the crossroads of two rival uh, international gangs: um, the Serranos working from the south, which are Mexican mafia, and of course the uh, the Nostra Familia in the north. And what's interesting is that both of those gangs really command and control everything from prison. And the role of prisons, not only in radicalization, but it's, it's entered a whole new threshold. Now, the plan is to go to prison. The plan is to go to prison, cut your teeth, and get trained. Uh, you, uh, they're putting, uh, the Nostra Familia are putting their, their troopers through programs in prison that would make ranger school look like Christmas morning. These guys are extremely well trained, and they are taking on uh, paramilitary uh, type capacity. Um, they're joining the army. And they're, and they're learning regiments uh, and, and training there as well. And we've even seen open source reporting of LA-based gangs pushing their guys over to Syria to fight. So, so, the, so the level and role that prisons play in all of this is, is something that we have to consider as well when we look at, uh, at the real problem set. I'm sorry, I feel like a pall has fallen on this room. It's all gloom and doom. Um, <laughs> but really, if you look at Ciudad Juarez, you guys are having great impact up there. For real, the answer is coming back to the answer. The answer coming back to what Enrique said is to mobilize those positive people. And there's a lot of people out there that really are hugely courageous. It is astounding and inspiring and humbling all the time to work with the people that we work with. That they are putting their lives at risk at, a, at all different levels. It could be a, a prosecutor, it could be the head of a, a school, it could be the head of a, a little community group. These are people who have decided enough is enough is enough. There are more of us, the good ones, than there are the bad ones. And the bad ones actually are very few in number. They're like, it's, it's astounding how small the, the number of gang members are. So there really, really is hope. But it is having the ability to identify, mobilize, and work with these people and then the time to be able to do it and then linking them to the different levels of government I mean it's it's a very complex process and we need to be able to have the time and the, the luxury of time to be able to do that You just set my sales pitch for everyone to move back to Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm from. We've got a big lake close by. Uh, we do have some organized crime, Youngstown, uh, something Chris and I were talking about earlier. Um, so there's obviously elements, right, uh, throughout the U.S. as well. I mean, uh, you talked about murder rates. You have examples of Detroit and Baltimore. You have domestic examples that you should look to in terms of homicides. Uh, that we could really think through in terms of how we've seen that take place here. You talked about gangs and talked about, you know, what are the lessons that we can be learning from prisons? Uh, and not necessarily letting drug dealers go rot in prisons, but figuring out more strategically how um, 
how they're thinking about some of these issues and challenges. Um, so I think that there's a lot we can do in domestically as well that has a global tie-in. So it's not just everything that's taking place over there, because one of the things you'll find is as you look at the longer term trends, you're going to have problems with jobs in the US. You're going to have problems with jobs in Europe, like you're already seeing in Spain and elsewhere. So it's not just the poorest of the poor nations that are going to be facing these long term development challenges. It's going to be a lot of the developed countries that are going to be facing this in the near term as well. Yeah, and I like your point. I, I, one thing I just want to say to that is I think that the, the whole notion of collaboration that you guys keep talking about with the cross-functional teams and bringing folks in a room that ordinarily might not come in a room to work on these problem sets. And I'm wondering uh, what you guys have seen. What is the? It's hard for us to do here in D.C. to get the right people in the room across different agencies and organizations. How difficult is it in some of the places you guys are working, and, and what are some of the possible options to do that? Because obviously getting folks around the table is pretty darn important. Yeah, very complicated creatures, human beings. Um, yeah, we have a hard time working together. Um, so it's hard, uh, but it is possible. And there's, what, I, what I've seen in my career, there are people who are really good at that. They're really good at getting people in a room who have disparate interests, maybe conflicting interests, and they're able to, over time, and with gaining trust, to make that happen. And so it's, there's no magic way, you just gotta, just keep pushing, 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 and look for those areas of, of commonality, which in a place of it, like an urban slum is, number one is security. It's security, security. Everybody has that in common. They want that. So start with that and work your way out from there. No, I think I would agree with uh, what Miguel said. I mean, oftentimes it comes down to having somebody who can actually facilitate well, because um, you see the, you know, the challenges of the coordination are at all levels. I mean, within the U.S. government, we have that challenge. We have it uh, with the donor community. We have it uh, with host government uh, counterparts and all the institutions, and then at the community level. So oftentimes it takes somebody who's got sort of the, the ability to, to convene and, and bring people together and keep the process going and, and uh, you know, find those champions and get them on board. And so I think that you know, when you see it happen, it's like magic, and it, you know, and you wish you could just kind of replicate it and take it somewhere else, but it doesn't quite work that way. So I think we all know from working in this, in this field of development, um, but it can happen. Yes, ma'am. Glad you asked, because it would be good to have some positive news. Um, there's a school in the community that Enrique mentioned, Tamelicon in San Pedro Sula, a hugely violent city, hugely violent part of a hugely violent city. The only high school serving this entire area was about to close, because the, it was on, it's on the border of two gangs, and you just can't cross borders, and so and teachers were being assaulted. I mean, it was a giant mess. So in the, the bottom line was the only high school serving a huge population area, maybe 150,000 people, was about to close. They went to our team in San Pedro and they said, help, help, help. We said, yeah, we were glad to help, but you got to get together with the police. This is a security issue. We're, no, we're not never working with the police. Never, never, never. Okay, well, then we can't help you because, you know, you can't wish or pray your way out of a situation like that. You have got to confront it. Fast forward a year later, uh, the enrollment in the school is up 40%. Uh, we just had a congressional delegation of four congressmen was just down there. Massive press. Lots of police. The chief of the police was there, teachers, parents. It was a huge public event. This community had stood up and said, enough. We are done with this. Enough. And they took that chance, and they did it. And now the school next door, which is a technical college, so this is like a regular high school. This is a technical high school over there. It's having the exact same problem. And so now those teachers are coming to, to us, to the teachers over there, and saying, what did you guys do? This is a, we're about to have to close the school. So yes, it is, it does work, but it takes time and it, it takes, it takes time, it takes time. Answer that, Enrique. 
We need, we need more research in Latin America in general, but I think uh, research in other places in the world has shown, Brazil is a good example, that uh, displacement happens, but in a, in a much lower uh, intensity than it was happening in the first place. So it's, it's something we should not care that much about, of obviously consider, but it's not that if you push here, you will have the exact, the, the exact same uh, dynamic happening somewhere else. It, it, it happens sometimes, but it happens uh, in a lower uh, intensity. And what uh, some research on the UPPs in Brazil showed is that s when you draw a boundary and you intervene in that place, some of the effects of, of what happened in that boundary spill over in the adjacent areas. So, so the, the, benef the benefits sometimes to the closest areas are greater than we expect. One observation I'd like to share with, with Afghanistan is when we started with the six rural villages and it, and it quickly spread to, to 99 districts, one of the things, we did some things good and some things bad there, but one of the things that we did see was that in an areas where they did push the insurgents out, where the community pushed the insurgents out, typically what we saw there was a revitalization of civil society resilience that, that, that wanted to rise to the surface anyway. It needed the space to do it. And, and, and we found by focusing on the social grievances, the, the, the threads that were being pulled by those violent extremists, um, it was just, it was kind of a, a court coming back up to the surface and, 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 and it, was, it needed to happen. Um, the security was the immediate focus, but once we started focusing on those grievances, uh, you know, the, the, the community kind of handled its own thing. My time in Salinas this past week, I saw a very similar thing with the community of Hebron. The neighborhood of Hebron is literally surrounded uh, by the Serranos and, 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 the Mexican, and the Mexican gangs, and they're fighting, it's like a war zone around Hebron. But Hebron, when you move through it, it's palpable. I mean, you can, you can, you can see the difference in that community, in the community center, in the park, in, in the involvement of local resilient leaders doing what they were meant to do. Um, and, and it is bottom up. The challenge is how do you, like you say, how do you expand that outward and work at those resiliencies um, uh, you know, that are beyond that community? And I think that, that one's yet to be addressed. Another signal. Awesome. In the back, sir. Um, what Miguel uh, pointed out is, is uh, most of these uh, areas of high conflictivity is uh, where the state is absent. That is is a, is a general thing you can find out. And I wonder, you know, you, you wonder when you travel in Central America, why we don't have gangs in Nicaragua? Why you don't have gangs in Costa Rica? Um, so it's obvious we don't need to do more research. The state presence diminish, diminish violence because the state exists in his nature to <coughs> deal with conflicts. If not, we will come back to the tribal, tribal world where everybody makes justice by their own hand. So if we have very clear that, why we insist in passing to the communities the responsibilities that belong to the state? It's obviously that in Honduras, it's not a legitimate government. It's a government that comes from a good etat, like it or not. It was a good etat, it was a legitimate government, and this, this government today is still carrying out the problem that is not legitimate. legitimacy, and the police is, is perceived in many communities as the same police that did, did political persecution against Elijah support. So that's the main problem why we don't bring, we cannot bring the police or the state institutions to communities in Honduras because the government is still carrying out the problem of being part of the coup d'etat. Different situations have in Nicaragua. You know, when you have, you compare Nicaragua and Costa Rica. Costa Rica, very democratic country, but they have the largest police in the region. They don't have army, but they have the largest police. Nicaragua have a political police. Police belongs, is under control of Ortega, and it's the same model of Cuba. Block by block, having people being, you know, informers uh, of what is going on, political side, to the central government. So uh, I think there are, the lessons are not in the communities. The lessons are in the states that works. And I, I wonder sometimes that we are throwing too much responsibility to the victims to resolve the problem. 
So, so that I, would just, uh, uh, just to respond. Yeah, yeah. please. We're going to have to wrap yeah. it up. I mean, I, I would have to respectfully disagree with you on that one because I think that you can't wait for the state institutions to deliver the solutions at the end of the day. I mean, take the city of Los Angeles, for example, that has had historically one of the worst gang problems in the U.S. They didn't sit around waiting for the state of California or the federal government to come solve the gang problem. They came up with a strategy which was basically a neighborhood strategy where they take back the streets. It's based on primary prevention, hand-in-hand -hand working with law enforcement, intervention workers who go out and um, disrupt potential acts of violence. It's a neighborhood approach. And they've been able to reduce the homicide rate rather significantly over the last 10 years. They didn't sit there waiting for California to, you know, correct its prison system or the federal government to, you know, pursue investigations of active gang members. They had to do what they had to do. And so the neighborhood approach has worked effectively in that context. So I think that at the end of the day, ultimately, sure, it's a combination of both things. But while we're waiting for things to happen at the state level, which we could be waiting for a very long time, and then the situation on the ground continues to deteriorate. I mean, I think, I mean, part of the effort also is to ensure that, you know, national governments do begin to adopt policies that will invest more money in social prevention and these other programs that will go hand in hand with the law enforcement effort and that's part of the you know that's part of the work that we're doing now it's you know i would say over the last six years we've made significant progress from where we were in terms of where the policies in central america were always about mano dura and lock everybody up to where you have governments now that are adopting prevention policies as part of a national of a national strategy and starting to invest some resources of course we'd like to see more but you know we're going on a sort of a positive trend in that sense so I hate to do it, but the long hook is starting to make its way into the room right now. And if I'm going to get you guys on your 15-minute lunch break to go grab your lunch and move to your lunchtime panel, uh, I've got to end it right there. I appreciate everybody's comments. I appreciate our panel and uh, all the thoughtful uh, conversation today. Wish you best of luck and God bless.